After I graduated from college, uh, that summer I was given a job at the Madison Fund, which was a closed-in mutual fund in, uh, in, uh, here in New York. And Ed Merkel ran it, and uh, what a terrific guy he was. Uh, and I was there for about uh, three weeks, and he said to me, he said, Kid, he used to call me Kid all the time, he said, Kid, uh, I want you to go out and uh, call on a company called Tri-State Motor Transit in Joplin, Missouri. And I said, that's, uh, that's interesting. I said, but who's going to go with me? And he said, what do you mean who's going to go with you? You're going to go by yourself. You're going to go meet with the president of this company, and you're going to uh, be there by yourself. And I said, well, I've never done this before. He says, well, no better way to learn than, uh, than trying it. So I put my questions together, and they reviewed them at the, uh, at the company at the Madison Fund before I went out. And I arrive out there, and uh, a man in jeans and a T-shirt picks me up at the airport, and it turns, he introduces himself, and I said, this is the president of the company. And I said, I knew that he was worth many millions of dollars because I knew how much stock he owned. And I said, well, I've just learned a great lesson that you can't tell a, a book by the cover. I said, what a, what a good experience this is. And I spent the day with him. Uh, he then took me to his house for dinner that night. And, uh, and the next morning, I spent some more time with him. And I called back to uh, uh, Ed Merkel, the Madison Fund. I said, we should start buying this stock. Now, what the company did was uh, they were in transportation business, uh, hauling explosives. Uh, during the Vietnam War, so they were doing very well, and I got lucky, and uh, every share of stock we bought, the stock kept going higher and higher, and uh, Merkel thought I was pretty smart uh, there. Um, <clears throat> then he sent me out to call on a few other companies, and I remember calling on Roy Disney, uh, uh, Disney, and that was just a great experience for me, never having uh, uh, met somebody like that. And, uh, I have read everything that I could before I got out there. I had all my questions uh, laid out. I would really thought through what I wanted to ask, and as a result, it went very well. Uh, I then finished that summer and uh, was going to go to business school at uh, Columbia to get my master's. And I told the Madison Fund people I was going to do this, which they, they knew. And they wanted me to stay, and I said, no, I'm going to go ahead and get my master's. And I started at uh, Columbia, and after my first semester, I said, I don't know if this is really for me. Uh, I remember being in a class, a marketing class, my first year, first semester. And the professor said, how many of you want to work for Procter & Gamble? And everybody's hands went up. And I said, oh my gosh, this is not for me. I've got to get out of here. This is, I'm in the wrong place. Uh, but so I called my dad, and I said, I'm going to drop out, and I'm going to go back to work for the Madison Fund. He said, no, you're making a mistake, uh, son. He says, I think uh, you've gotten the worst over. The first semester is always the hardest at business school, and, and stick with it. It'll always be good to have your master's. And long story short, I did stick with it. And I uh, then uh, uh, asked the Madison Fund uh, if I couldn't come back and work, though, for the next three semesters while I was getting my master's at the same time. And they said, fine. I said, well, I'll have to work around my course schedule, and I'll try to arrange my courses so that I can do more work with the Madison Fund than, than a little less work maybe up at Columbia. And uh, I did that, <coughs> and I was able to call on other companies. And eventually, uh, the Madison Fund had a company which they controlled. Uh, it was the old Missouri-Kansas Texas Railroad, uh, Denison, Texas. And we set up a holding company to uh, utilize the tax loss that was being generated by this railroad as it, uh, they were abandoning track that went into cornfields and so forth. And Merkel came to me one day and he said, uh, he said uh, Henry, he said, I'd like uh, you to buy companies for, uh, for Katy Industries. And I said, well, that's fascinating, but I said, I don't know how to buy a company. Uh, I've never bought a company in my life. And he said, look, kid, he said, you know how to pick stocks. He said, you buy a company the same way you buy stocks. If you don't like it, you just sell it, and that's, and that's that. And I said, well, it doesn't sound right to me, but this man's been pretty good in the stock market. He must know. He's a lot older than I am. And so I, I said, fine, I'll, uh, let's see if I can find some companies. And I thought about areas where I could buy small companies and really build a group. <clears throat> and it was the oil service business I picked uh, because there were a lot of family companies uh, down in Louisiana in particular. So I spent a lot of time in New Orleans and found a number of companies uh, in the surrounding areas like Houma, Louisiana, and Berwick, Louisiana, and Lake Charles. And I go down and it was always, I'd sit in these people's homes in their kitchen sometime eating uh, crayfish with them and shrimp. And, and they'd say, uh, well, where's uh, the guy with gray hair? I assume somebody with gray hair is going to come down. If my company's going to be sold, I'm not going to sell it to some kid here. I'm going to sell it to some guy with gray hair. And I said, 
well, unfortunately, it's me. It's, it's the only one you get to deal with. And so I bought a few companies, and they worked out all right. And uh, eventually I left uh, uh, the Madison Fund and KD Industries and, and uh, then uh, ended up at, at Bear Stearns in their corporate finance department, where my uh, cousin, George Roberts, uh, was working and also where Jerry Kohlberg was working. And Jerry had bought a company as the first buyout that uh, the firm had done in 1965. And I started studying it, liked what I, what I saw, and George and I kept talking about it. And, we, uh, and then late 60s, we started buying a few companies in early 70s, and they were all very small uh, companies. George, at that point, was in San Francisco and uh, with Bear Stearns, and I was in New York with Jerry. And we bought, uh, oh, probably uh, seven or eight or nine different companies in the early 70s, and culminating in the uh, largest acquisition that Bear Stearns uh, did, uh, which was in 1975, is a company called Encom International. And it was the, the industrial components group of companies uh, from Rockwell. And we paid $92 million to buy this company. And uh, uh, Bear Stearns, I remember, got the biggest uh, fee they'd ever gotten, uh, which was in 1975, was uh, $950,000. And uh, we decided shortly after that, that's uh, George and Jerry and I, to leave the firm. Uh, we wanted to do something on our own and uh, really wanted to concentrate just on uh, management buyouts or leverage buyouts, which are one and the same. And I, uh, uh, we said, okay, let's go off. And in May, on May 1st, 1976, we formed this firm. And uh, uh, the rest is history. We, uh, we got lucky. Uh, I think we've had some principles that we've stuck to, uh, very disciplined investors and very disciplined people here. And uh, that's what's given us uh, uh, the ability to say no. It's one of the most important things at the end uh, of the day is being able to say no to an investment. Uh, even if you've done a lot of work, uh, work will never hurt you. And, uh, but once you buy a company, uh, you're married. You're married to that company. And it's not like Ed Merkel said, if you don't like it, you just sell it. Uh, you know, you've got it. And it's a lot harder to, to sell a company than it is to buy a company. And since we formed the firm in 1976, uh, we've bought uh, some 38 different companies, and we spent about $65 billion uh, buying these different companies. And people always uh, will call and congratulate us when we buy a company or when it's announced. And I said, look, don't congratulate us when we buy a company congratulate us when we sell it. I said, any fool can overpay and buy a company as long as money will last uh, to buy it. I said, our job really begins the day we, uh, we buy the company. Uh, and we start working with the management. We start working about where this company is headed and make sure that that capital structure that we have in place is the right capital structure. And I think that's, uh, that's the reason that we've been successful. It's, it's not just buying the company. Sure, we picked right companies, and we picked the right management. We've given them the right incentive to, uh, uh, to perform. But most importantly, uh, we've uh, had the management have the right incentives. And management has been an owner. Management has had their, uh, their own um, uh, equity on the line. Uh, they have something at risk. Uh, I always like to refer to many managers in corporate America uh, as the renters of the corporate assets, not the owners. And I said, you know, where have the Carnegies and the Mellons and the Rockefellers gone? Well, a lot of them are gone. And our concept is to bring that back, to bring back that ownership, so that if you have something at risk, you think differently. Rent an Avis rent-a-car. If you go out and you rent an Avis rent-a-car and you put a scratch on it, well, you're not going to be that happy, but it's not going to really upset you that much. What you really want to do is get it back to the Avis counter before they, they see the scratch. Whereas in, uh, if you own your own car, you put a scratch in that car, you're going to be out there polishing it and making sure that scratch is going. You're going to take extra special care. It's exactly the same concept if you own a company. If you have uh, your own money at risk, what happens eventually you start to say, well, do we really need all those people that we have in the company? Do we need a, uh, uh, as many airplanes? RJR, for example, uh, we had 81 people in the flight department when we bought the company, and they had 11 corporate jets. Today, we have about 24 people in the flight department. We have four, four planes uh, today. We've got one airport versus four airports that the company had. And you just think differently. So 
I'm giving you a, a, a very long uh, answer to, uh, to what appears to be a simple question, but everything was done in steps, and, and everything becomes a building block. And as my mother has said to me on many, many occasions, uh, you've got to build the foundation first. If you build that foundation, both the moral and the ethical foundation, as well as the, uh, uh, the business foundation and the experience foundation, then the, f then the building won't crumble. But if you don't build that foundation, and it's not a solid foundation, the building will crumble. It's funny. I never thought that there was such a big deal when we, uh, when we made the offer. <laughs> I guess it wasn't until I woke up after we bought it, and uh, see, that was really a big deal. <clears throat> that wasn't the issue. That isn't how we looked at things. We didn't say, gee, we want to buy the biggest company in the world, so we've got to own this company. That, look, if the, if the company didn't make sense or the price didn't make sense uh, or we couldn't do the financing on the proper terms, we wouldn't have done it. Uh, it would have been as simple as that. But in <clears throat> 1984, we were called in to, to make a bid on Gulf Oil when Boone Pickens had gone up to the management asked us to get involved with the company. And uh, that, uh, our, our offer then was a little over $13 billion. And we never really thought a lot about it. I mean, we bought companies for $8 billion, which is the, uh, the Beatrice acquisition. We bought uh, Safeway for 4 and a half or $5 billion, and Owens, Illinois, for about the same number. <clears throat> and there was money available uh, out there. And so it wasn't an issue of, gee, it's $25 billion versus $8 billion. That wasn't really what went through. What, what went through our minds is a lot, lot to wrestle with. First of all was the smoking issue. Uh, no one at KKR smoked, and so it was, we had to wrestle with that. Uh, uh, did we want to own a company that was in the tobacco business? Um, if we ended up buying a company of this size and this visibility, it had to work because it is under a microscope, and everybody in America is waiting for this thing to fail, and we never doubted that it would that it would succeed. I mean, we knew it would succeed. And uh, we, we want to make sure that the, that the capitalization of the company was proper so that if there was a hiccup in the earnings, that it had a fallback. The companies that have gotten into trouble are those that have razor-thin margin for error. And Murphy's Law, something's going to go wrong. And so things always, they never work out exactly as you uh, plan them. So you've got to make room for the possibility that things will not be exactly as, uh, as you had hoped or as you planned. So we built that into that capital structure. And uh, visibility was a, was a big issue with us. Um, what did it mean to our families? What did it mean to our private life, particularly George Roberts and myself? Uh, it was something that uh, both of us wrestled with a lot. How was Washington going to view, view this? What did it mean as far as how we'd be accepted or not accepted in, in, uh, by senators and congressmen and, you know, were they going to be after us uh, because we've made this large acquisition? We didn't start it, as you know. It was started by the management of the company. We came in and, and uh, succeeded in buying it. So these were the things that went through our mind, much more than, gee, it's $25 billion. Uh, we said, because it's $25 billion and because we're borrowing $14 billion from the banks of bank debt, that if this fails, we don't want to be the ones known uh, to, to have brought down the banking system. We have to make this work. Well, there really were two, day, two, two points in time that were very important. One was the day that the, uh, after a very long, long day and all night we'd been up, um, we thought we had an agreed upon deal. Um, the other group came back and started raising their bid and that threw the board of directors uh, into uh, turmoil. And they spent from 8 o'clock in the morning or so when we appeared before the board until 7 o'clock that night debating, you know, did they want to take the Ross Johnson Shearson offer or did they want to take the KKR offer? <clears throat> and I felt enormous relief uh, when they came out and said, all right, you've won. They had come out earlier, about two hours earlier, and they said, we would like you, uh, and we'll pay you an enormous fee. Uh, I think it was something like uh, $250 million to uh, give us two more weeks to decide who to pick. 
and we didn't blink an eye. We said, absolutely not. You've got until today, and that is it. We want to own this company. We're not in it for the fee business. We are in it because we want to own this company, and uh, we're not giving you any more time at all. And that was all documented in Barbarians at the Gate, and uh, in hindsight, um, we stuck to our principles. We're not in the fee business of doing deals just for fees. We're in the, in the business of buying companies and owning the equity and putting our own money up and making a company better. That's the opportunity we wanted. And we stuck to it, and we ended up uh, being successful in, in, in buying the company. And I felt great relief and, and, and excitement about it. I, I felt great excitement for our whole team because this firm was brought so much uh, closer together. Our advisors were brought much closer together with us, uh, particularly Dick Beatty, who was our lead counsel and the, who was the chairman of Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett, and just a wonderful human being. And that uh, was, was great pleasure for us. Our accountants who lived with us uh, from Deloitte, uh, Haskins, and Sells in the, that time. And uh, so that was all great uh, excitement and relief. And the second time was the day that the tender offer was, uh, was actually accepted uh, and we had enough uh, shares in and we actually took control of the company. I guess it was a third period, which was in between, which was the day that uh, the bank financing had to, uh, to be in and we <clears throat> were concerned would we get enough uh, bank financing. I had gone all over the world. I was in Europe and I'd been in Japan uh, and in the States uh, with a couple of my associates raising this bank financing and it was the day that that had to come in and we had the big the large bid the large uh, amounts of uh, of commitments coming in and we far exceeded what we had thought and that was great uh, revelation because if we didn't get there we didn't know what we were going to do so we went to every bank in the world practically of size so those were the three periods i mean another great story about you know when you when you have a bid accepted or you or you get a transaction closed the actual closing of it is anticlimactic. Uh, it's the time that really that the bid is accepted uh, or the time you get the financing as in the case of RJR and the others it wasn't as, as a big a concern because they were smaller and there was a lot of money available at, in those days. How times have changed. <laughs> Just that feeling uh, you know up there in the, in the uh, in the air and that camaraderie and just that excitement of, of wanting each other to know it's really part of a teamwork and and it's one of the great pleasures I get is that team and that teamwork and uh, uh, making it work that way. You know, the thing I like to people say, well, how do you describe KKR? And I like to describe KKR as a football team. I, I say it's a football team with a two-headed quarterback, with George Roberts and myself as the, the quarterback calling the, the plays. And everybody's got a position to play. Uh, some play tackle and guard and some play halfback. And not everybody can carry the ball. Uh, but if... Uh, the people that are on the line don't play their positions, then the quarterback or the halfback uh, or the ends are going to get tackled, and, and we're not going to go to the, uh, to the Super Bowl. And uh, I said, but if everybody knows the role they've got to play and everybody is uh, compensated according to how the team does, not according to just how you do as an individual, uh, we're going to do much better. And that's exactly how we run this firm. We run as a team. Uh, not only does everybody have a say, but everybody knows what they have to do. And we don't have to be telling people all the time what they have to do. These are self-starters at this firm. My dad was reading an article in Time magazine about uh, uh, the uh, Oxford, Cambridge of the West Coast because it's a group of small colleges. It's Pomona and Scripps and Harvey Mudd were there at the time in the graduate school in Claremont. And uh, uh, I wanted to go to the West Coast uh, because I'd been in the East boarding school for five years. I'm from Oklahoma originally. And I said, I want to see how the other half of the United States lives. And, uh, and I love to play golf, too. And so I uh, wanted to play competitive golf out there. So I, uh, I went out, and uh, I uh, liked it, except my first year it was like a prep school with ashtrays. <laughs> so. Uh, so I decided that uh, maybe I would transfer. And then the more I thought about it, uh, the more I said, no, this is the right school. And then I, I really went there for, uh, because it was very strong in economics and in political science. And those were the two areas that I wanted to focus uh, my uh, uh, future on. I was an economics major in, uh, in college. And every summer when I was on uh, 
uh, and after school, I would drive my car from California, from uh, Claremont uh, Men's College at the time, to, uh, to New York, and I worked on Wall Street. Started out as a runner, I, uh, which was a messenger. I went to uh, uh, the other runners' homes in Brooklyn and Queens, and just to see how they, uh, how they lived, how they thought. Uh, they were totally different than I was. And uh, then my next summer, I worked in the research department at Goldman Sachs. And my last summer, I was in uh, the institutional sales and uh, in, uh, <coughs> in corporate finance. And I thought at the time that I wanted to go into institutional sales, which were selling stocks and bonds to institutions. And I said, because in those days, which was now in the 1960s, the uh, salesman was making about $100,000 a year. And, and I said, that's just an enormous amount of money. But the one thing that always stuck in the back of my mind was I said, what happens if, for some reason, uh, this institutional sales doesn't really work? I mean, it, it's not all that it's uh, supposed to be. I said, I'm really trained to do nothing. I am trained to be maybe a shoe salesman. And, uh, and I said, uh, the second thing that bothered me, I said, you know, when I'm old, that meant 45 years of age, I said, I won't have an office. I don't want to be at some desk yelling and screaming and people hearing what I'm saying on the phone all the time. And I said, that bothers me. These people don't have an office. And uh, so I then started looking on the corporate finance side and uh, became fascinated by that. Uh, but I said, uh, before I make up my mind what I want to do, I want to find out how uh, an institution uh, that buys stocks and buys bonds, a fund, how do they make the decisions? How do they make a decision to buy, uh, whether it's uh, you know General Motors or IBM or whatever company it is? I want to find out how the other side works because I don't understand how it is that one time uh, a institutional salesman has a special on uh, IBM and the next day he's got a special uh, block of stock on some other company and then an another day another company. How can he know so much about these different companies other than reading a you know, one page is given to them by the research department. I'm going to find out how the decisions are really made from the other side, and then I'll make a decision what I'm going to do. My father wanted me to go in the oil business. He was in the oil and gas business as a uh, consulting petroleum engineer out in Tulsa. Uh, had an incredibly good reputation, which, interestingly, I learned more and more about as I was living in New York because everybody would come to me and say, are you Ray Kravis' son? And I would just beam uh, and say, yeah, I didn't know you knew my dad. Oh, yes, you know, I worked with your dad on this uh, transaction or on this uh, company in the oil business. And I, um, I thought about it, but I said, look, as proud as I am of my father, I don't want to be known as Ray Kravis' son. Uh, I want to do something myself. And I hope my children will do something on their own. Uh, my dad helped me. He was there as a uh, very loving and supportive father. But uh, I said, I've got to do it myself. As a kid, my mother uh, says to me, you know, you were always uh, me myself as a kid. You wanted to tie your shoes when you didn't even know how to tie your shoes. Uh, but you had to do it yourself. And uh, uh, I guess that's just the reason. So I picked a field uh, where I'd had a little exposure. Uh, where I thought I could uh, have an enormous challenge and have a, a chance to really do some good, to, uh, to be a pioneer in an area and, uh, and not just be like everyone else. And, and that became the, uh, the field of finance and, uh, in particular, the leverage buyout field. And in hindsight, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Uh, it's been uh, just a phenomenal uh, career for me so far. And... Uh, I don't see any reason why I should change. We wanted to pick a niche, first of all, where, uh, which we started in the late 60s. And uh, it was a way for a family company. When we bought companies at the, at the beginning, companies were bought on the basis of, uh, there were family companies that said, look, I've got an estate problem. Uh, I've got a son in the business, maybe he's good, maybe he's not good. I really don't want to sell out to big XYZ company because I like the fact that our company's independent, it's been a family company for 50 years or whatever. I don't want to go public, I don't want to have a public company. And so we created this concept of uh, letting the management and the uh, 
basically have their cake and eat it too, letting this owner sell out and at the same time continue on in a management role with an ongoing equity stake. So he may have owned, the family may have owned 100% of the company initially, and uh, we may buy the company and let uh, he and his family own 20% of it and continue to run it. So he's solved his estate problems. He's solved the succession problem in part because we're there now, and he doesn't have to make that tough decision. A lot of fathers can't make that decision. They, they know their son's not really up to the task or daughter, but, but they don't want to be uh, the one to make that decision. They want somebody in between to make that decision, and they can say, look, uh, I'm really sorry, uh, you know, it wasn't my decision. You know, I sold the company. It really was up to, to KKR or whoever else bought the company. And so the, the LBO, or in those days called the management buyout, because management was such an integral part of it, was uh, the concept was really developed to take care of estate problems. And uh, then it grew from that point in the, in the 60s, early 60s, I'm sorry, mid-60s, late 60s, to buying divisions and subsidiaries of public companies. And uh, uh, where a public company decided they didn't want this business anymore, but they didn't want to sell it to a big company, and it was a way for the management to become an owner, run their own show. And then from that, it led to uh, uh, the first public, buy, uh, co public company buyouts, which were companies that we acquired in 1977. That was our first uh, acquisition of a publicly owned company called AJ Industries on the New York Stock Exchange. $26 million in purchase price. <coughs> and that's really how it, uh, how it developed, how it grew up. The challenge to me are, I think, several fold. One, I love the creativity. I love the ability to create a, a capital structure uh, that is appropriate for a company uh, uh, no matter what field it happens to be in. I love the ability to make a company more efficient. Uh, I love the ability to work with very good managers and to provide the right incentives for them and truly become a partner with that management and make that management uh, take a long view. Trouble, in, in my opinion, with corporate America today is that everything is thought of in quarters. Uh, analysts push them, well, what are you going to earn this quarter? And we say to the management of companies, you're here today, where do you want to be five years from now and how are you going to get there? And it may very well mean taking a step backwards. But believe me, in five years, we're going to have a company that is much more productive, efficient, and competitive. And that's a challenge. One of the problems with corporate America is we're, in many respects, losing our corporate uh, competitiveness uh, in this global environment. And if we can just take a few companies and use those as models, as examples, uh, to show the rest of the corporate America how they can become more competitive. Uh, that's, what, that's what I like to do, and that's what I hope to do. And we're very proud of that, of that aspect. It's not just make a lot of money. Yes, we've been fortunate. We've made a lot of money. Uh, some people say maybe we've made too much money, but it's a way to keep score is all. Uh, what's, what's more important is not coming into work and, and, and counting the money. What's more important is coming in and saying, I've got a challenge today and I want to, uh, uh, to overcome that challenge, and I want to conquer uh, whatever we've set out. And we all set goals for ourselves. Uh, the second thing I, I love, and I said this earlier, that uh, I've, I've been in a hurry all my life. <clears throat> I've been in a hurry to succeed. I've been in a hurry to, to prove myself, and maybe it's because my father was so successful in a totally different field. But I... Uh, found uh, working in a small environment uh, just a, a great joy. Uh, I have in my partner, George Roberts, uh, a person that uh, is the most wonderful man in the world uh, to me. He's, uh, he's like a brother to me. And, and uh, creating with him, being side by side with him, and uh, uh, whatever we try to do uh, is a real pleasure uh, for me. And it's family. He's my first cousin uh, also. And so... Uh, you might say that both of us got lucky because it really has worked, uh, worked well. And that's one of the other things that makes it a real joy to come in. We have 16 professionals at this firm, and we've handpicked <coughs> every one of them. We don't pick them off of a resume. Almost everyone that works here has been on the other side of a deal from us, uh, another side of a trainer, either a lawyer or an accountant or an investment banker or a banker. And so we've seen them under pressure. 
And believe me, it's totally different picking a person who you've seen in the firing line as opposed to picking them off a piece of paper. I'm looking for people that are bright, have the highest ethical uh, standards, will not compromise one iota for that. I want people who are creative. I want people who will stand up to me, uh, people that are not afraid to say exactly what's on their mind. <clears throat> Even though that's probably not what I want to hear, that's great. That's what I want to hear. I'll give you an example. And it really came to life when we were buying uh, RJR. We were deciding to bid or not to bid what the price we wanted to bid, and we'd have sessions. There were about seven or eight of us. There's George Robertson, myself, and Paul Rather, one of my other partners, and then <clears throat> four or five associates. And we'd sit in my office, and uh, after we'd run all the numbers and we'd talk uh, things through, and, we'd, and I'd always start with the youngest person in the, uh, in the room, the youngest member of the team, and I said, what do you think? And it was Scott Stewart uh, and Cliff Robbins, they were two, uh, the two youngest. Because I wanted to hear what they thought as opposed to having them hear what we thought. And it, everything comes from the bottom up. And have a very good interchange. And we'd always be the last, George and I, to say well, what, what we thought. And, and so it's not a directive. Uh, saying, we will buy this company, run the numbers and prove that we're, gonna, that we're doing the right thing. It's, should we buy this? What do you think? And letting them communicate, letting them say what's on their mind. We want the, man, the, the, uh, the members of this firm, whether they're an associate or whether they're a partner, to put their own money up in every transaction, their own money at risk. Just like we ask the management to have their money at risk, we do the same thing here. Uh, we have everyone at KKR, from the receptionist at the front to you met when you came in, to all the secretaries, they own stock in every one of our companies. Now, granted, they have it on options, but our people here working on the transactions put their own money up. And uh, you think differently. And we want people who are not afraid to take risk, uh, who, are fr who are not afraid of a challenge. And I want people <coughs> who are uh, going to be diligent. Uh, they're going to ask the tough questions, and they're going to keep probing and keep probing until they're satisfied, and not just say, well, he told me this, so it must be right. A little bit like a reporter sometimes, uh, asking questions all the time. We have a, uh, uh, a fear all the time, but that's what keeps us going. That's what keeps us focused. You have to have a fear. People who say, I have no fear, and I'm not afraid of ever failing, uh, they're kidding themselves. Uh, sometimes it's the fear of failure of not wanting to fail, uh, that makes people as great as they are. Uh, I know that's what pushes me a lot. Uh, I've always said, and I say it to my children, <clears throat> I said, you know, I'm the kind of person that could fall out of a window, well, land on my head, I'm going to bounce a couple times, and I'm going to come up on my feet, because I'm going to make myself come up on my feet. And uh, you have to be uh, a little bit of an optimist, too, but a realist. And uh, uh, risk is important to take. Not foolishly, not uh, blind risk, um, but <clears throat> I, I love the word entrepreneur. And uh, I ask uh, students sometimes up at Columbia, I'm on that board, and I ask them, uh, how many of you want to be an entrepreneur? A lot of hands go up, and I said, okay, you explain to me. What does that mean? Well, I'd like to go work at, uh, at IBM. And I said, you just failed. That's not, that doesn't count. I said, how about you? Well, I'd like to work at uh, Procter & Gamble. And I uh, said, you failed to. A real entrepreneur is somebody that has no safety net underneath them, but really, truly has an idea and has a vision and sticks to their convictions. You've got to have the courage of your convictions. And a lot of people are going to tell you you're wrong. If you did everything by consensus, you wouldn't do anything at all. I mean, look at... Uh, I think it was uh, the people that started Kodak uh, and certainly uh, uh, Mr. Land of the Polaroid uh, company. They all thought he was nuts, uh, both of them. He, the Kodak, he went door to door to get uh, to raise money and most people slammed the door in this man's face. But he stuck to it and uh, he has what he has today. It would have been very easy for us to shut up shop here at KKR and uh, just say, well, look, uh, it's just too, too difficult and, and it's not going to work. Uh, but no, uh, we've had some failures, of course. I mean, not everything works. We're in a high-risk business. Uh, but thank God we've had a lot more successes than we've had failures, and we've only had a couple that haven't worked out, and the jury's still out on those.
But she asked me one day, she said, tell me the three things, three words, I want just three words, that are how you would describe your life, things that are very, very important to you. I thought about it uh, for a minute, and I said to her, courage, integrity, and commitment. And those are three things that I basically live my life by. And she had a seal made, and she had uh, a box made, engraved in silver, uh, which had those, those three things written on it in a, in a seal that she had for me. And uh, those three words, those three terms, have worked for me. I don't work for everybody. But you talk about courage. Come back to having the courage of your convictions. The ability to face failure. As I said, there's nothing wrong with failing. Pick yourself up and try it again. You're never going to know how good you really are until you go out and you face failure. Integrity, that's a given. If you don't have integrity, you have nothing. You can't buy it. You can have all the money in the world. But if you're not a moral and an ethical person, you really have nothing because you only have one thing to sell in life, and that's yourself. And commitment, commitment to me is the ability to stick to something. You make up your mind. I hate people that go out and always talk about they're going to do this, they're going to do that, and they never do it. And I said, quit talking about it. Just go do it. I don't want to hear about it. When you've done it or you made an attempt to do it, that's fine. I tell my children from when they were very young, you know, kids have a, have a term, and it's always, I can't do it. They don't know whether they can do it or they can't do it until they try it. But it's easy. I can't do it. I can't ski. I can't ride a bike. I can't. I tell my kids, I say, just take that word out of your vocabulary because the word can't isn't in your vocabulary until you've really made an attempt to try it. And if you've really tried something and you've given it your best effort, that's all I ever ask of you. But make a commitment to do something. You have a vision? Fine. It's not going to be a straight road to the, uh, to the goal line. It's going to be a lot of zigs and zags and, and uh, you know, uh, throwing for some losses. The other thing I say to my children, I said, <clears throat> be on that field. Don't sit on the sideline. Don't sit on the sideline and, and focus uh, on what other people are doing. And don't be on that sideline and uh, putting your leg out trying to tr trip the runner as he comes down the, uh, the side. You get on that field and you play. And you wear the same uniform. And you get banged up just like everybody else. And then you're going to know what it's like. It's easy to criticize. Anybody can criticize. But you get on that field and you play, and you're going to have a totally different respect for yourself, a different sense of one's worth. And it's very important not to do that. Another thing I tell my children, I said, don't worry about what the other person's doing. You know, a lot of people are always worried about what somebody else is doing. I said, I love people that are worried about what I'm doing. I said, people seem to know more about what I'm doing than I know about what I'm doing. And I hear it all the time. And I guess as you get luckier and a little more successful, you hear a little more of that. And I said, quit worrying about what other people are doing. Because I said, if you're worrying about what other people are doing, you're not doing anything yourself. I said, you're on that sideline. And you're just watching. You, gotta need, you need to know what your competition's doing. You need to know what the environment's like. But don't dwell on what other people are doing. I love people who dwell on what I'm doing, particularly if they're in our field. Because... I'm out there behind the wheel driving along and they're, and they're trying to catch up. And that's great. Well, at first, not very well. I, uh, I took everything very personally. Uh, I'd read every word and uh, just like my wife did. I mean, she would read every word. And, and together, we, we overcame this. Uh, we said, you know, finally, enough people told us that most people don't remember what they've read to begin with. Uh, they only remember a trend. And as long as you're honest uh, and as long as you're reasonably successful, they'll remember that. And um, I remember someone called me one day right in the, after the heat of battle in RJR and we were getting beaten up pretty badly uh, in the press and uh, uh, because the other side had really gone after us and was planning all the stories. And we had always taken an attitude of not talking to the press. We just said, look, our record speaks for itself, and we'll, uh, we'll just let it stand. And uh, I think that was probably a mistake in, uh, in the yard yard because the other side kept feeding what they wanted in, and there was no rebuttal from our side, so pretty soon people started to believe the other side. And we learned a lot from that, and it was, it was very hard. 
and uh, people would tell me, uh, said, forget about it. You know, uh, a day-old newspaper is good to wrap fish in, and uh, let's forget about uh, the fact that, uh, you know, this was written uh, about you. It was hard. It was very hard for me to, uh, to feel that uh, I want people to like me. You know, I wanted people to like what we did, and, and because we worked hard at it. It's, it's like any creative person. You don't want, them to, you want everybody to, to feel like you feel about it. Well, not everybody's going to have the same feeling, and so it was, uh, it was, a, it was a very hard thing for me to, uh, to learn to live with. Today, uh, I've learned to try to educate as a few good reporters. And I said, look, if I got a few good reporters that really understand what we do, as opposed to pulling something that was wrong out of a computer and then compounding it by writing something more that's wrong, pretty soon they, the whole story's all wrong. I said, we can educate these people, then I'm going to have a fair, a fair chance at getting my point across. And, uh, but you know, the press hasn't changed. I've gone back and read uh, stories about uh, uh, J.P. Morgan and, and how he hated the press. And here was a man that was enormously successful. And you think about, well, J.P. Morgan was an incredible financier uh, in his time. People wrote about him. They didn't like him. They thought what he was doing was wrong. Uh, uh, you know, he was making very large acquisitions and also bailing out a lot of companies by uh, being the provider of last resource, uh, practically. And uh, he... He, a uh, provider last source, I mean, he, he, um, he lived with it, I'll live with it, you know, nothing's going to change. One person from my role model is my father. Uh, I, I just beam with pride about, uh, about him. Uh, he's now, uh, 89 years old, he plays golf all the time, and, uh, he's got lots of friends, and, He's a man who taught me something that's very, very important. And that was give back to society what you've taken out of it. Uh, I've been really fortunate that way. I'm glad I learned it at a very young age that, yes, I've been very successful and I've been lucky uh, and uh, maybe I've made more money than I deserve. And, but uh, some of the most uh, important moments in my life and moments that have given me the most pleasure have clearly been the times that I've been able to make a major contribution in money or time and effort uh, to those less fortunate. Uh, whether it's a drug program that I've uh, started here in New York, uh, which we got funding from the federal government plus my own money, uh, and if it works, we'll roll it out nationwide, uh, uh, to uh, uh, being chairman of the, of the uh, public television station here, Channel 13, and uh, being involved in education, which is very important to me, and I think it's a to me, it, it's our future in this country of educating children. Uh, the arts, I, I'm very involved with the arts, uh, whether it be uh, the Metropolitan Museum or the New York City Ballet. Uh, Central Park, I've been very involved in. So uh, I'm trying to, to uh, this wonderful park out here, I'm trying to make it more beautiful for those uh, people who live in New York. Uh, it's our 834 acres of uh, green space here. Uh, we've got to have it uh, for everybody. Uh, and uh, uh, he's my hero because uh, he, uh, he taught me uh, uh, the joy of giving, uh, the, the, the joy of people, of getting to know a lot of people and having those friendships that are, that are binding uh, friendships. That's, that's important. Uh, another hero who, of course, I've only read about, Winston Churchill. Uh, I mean... A real renaissance man, uh, incredible leader, incredible thinker, prolific writer, great orator, uh, artist, uh, just a wonderful, wonderful man. They don't make him like uh, Winston Churchill anymore. And uh, that's, a, uh, that's another person that is a, a role model. Uh, I... Uh, I don't have a lot of role models per se, you know. I've, I've sort of set my own goals and set my own, my own objectives, um, and things that are really important to me. It's that foundation my mother gave me, and that's what I try to live by, as opposed to saying I want to be like that person. I don't want to be like anybody. I want to be like me, and I just like uh, the fact I can read about these other people, or I have this wonderful input from my father uh, that uh, enabled me to be the way I am, and and that's what's important. 
have a teacher who uh, was a, a great influence on me uh, when I was in uh, boarding school at Loomis, uh, Jim Wilson. He was my uh, economics teacher and uh, he was also my dorm head. And I didn't know what economics was before I took this course. And I was really moved by it, by the course. I was moved by him. Uh, and uh, that's probably one of the reasons I, I chose the field of business, interestingly, uh, was this course that I had and, and how much I enjoyed it and how much challenge that, that he gave me to learn about economics, learn about supply side economics and, and demand uh, by the consumer and wage push uh, uh, inflation and, and uh, so forth. And, and I, uh, uh, I look back, in fact, I saw him last night. I, every year I, he brings his economics class down to New York and I give him a dinner uh, in New York after they spent the day going around to see the banks and uh, investment banks. And I talked to him for a couple hours and uh, let them ask questions. And I really just enjoy it, uh, enjoy doing that. And so that's, a, that's another person that had a great influence on my life. I wasn't a great student. I, uh, I was all right. In the courses I, 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 uh, I liked, I did very well. Uh, but the courses I didn't really care about, I don't think I did quite as well as I, my parents would probably have liked me to, uh, to have done. Uh, I did very well in the political science courses, I did very well in the economics and finance courses as I uh, went through uh, college and graduate school. Uh, but uh, I was eager to learn. I was eager to learn everything that I could. But probably more importantly than anything, I was eager to, uh, uh, to apply what I learned. Uh, that's why this job at the Madison Fund was so important to me and I look back about how much I really learned as I was on-the-job training. There is no substitute for, for on-the-job training. I loved athletics uh, in, in school when I was <clears throat> in uh, my boarding school days. I, I played football. I was captain of the wrestling team my last year in, in high school, and, and I ran track. And uh, I've always been very, very competitive. I love competition. And uh, the more competition, the happier I am. You know, just tell me I can't do something, and uh, that's all I need to hear. And uh, I can really get fired up to, uh, to do it. It's, uh, it's the easier things that maybe I, I get a little lax on. But, um, so I always like the competition at school. I like the competition of sports. I like the teamwork. I love being a, a member of, the, of a team. But if you look at track <clears throat> and you look at wrestling uh, in particular, they were, they were individual sports um, but part of a team. And so uh, I, again, it comes back to I didn't have to rely on anybody else. Nobody else let me down. Uh, there, I was as fast as I was going to be as fast, and I wrestled as well as I could wrestle. And if I lost, that was my own fault. I had nobody to blame but myself. And that was something I learned in school. I learned a lot about uh, don't look for excuses. You know, you have nobody to blame but yourself. You know, don't try to say it was his fault or her fault because, you know, in the end, in the end, you have to be held accountable, and uh, and that's the important thing. Uh, I had a lot of friends in school. I, I, I love friends. I was uh, very social in, in school. And as I got to college, I probably spent more time uh, going to parties than I, than I probably should have, but it was all part of it. Got out to California, and I'd love to play golf. And when I was in high school, the school didn't have a golf team. So I, uh, out of Claremont, uh, went out for the golf team my freshman year, and I made it. And I uh, played four years of competitive golf in Southern California. And I, they uh, liked me captain my last two years, and, and I love that challenge, uh, again, of uh, playing sort of 25 to 30 matches a, a year and four or five tournaments, and uh, uh, I was all right. I wasn't great, but I was, I was all right. I guess I got down to sort of a one handicap, and, uh, uh, but, you know, these kids today, they're, they're scratch or better, and so uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was a great experience. It was also a humbling experience, uh, too, to play against... Uh, Schools uh, like Southern Cal and Stanford we played against once, and UCLA we played against uh, every year, and these kids would be out there, and I mean, they, they were good. And many of those kids went on and, and turned pro. Uh, but being able to beat them sometimes, I mean, that was, uh, that was a challenge that I, that I always loved. There was a book that I read. Uh, it was called Escape from Freedom that I read in school. And uh, I relate to it a lot because it talks about people always wanting total freedom, wanting to do whatever they want to do. But in reality, uh, people want bounds. People want to be able to hold on to something. 
they want to be able to know that this is the outer limit of whatever <clears throat> it happens to be. And it's like a child growing up. A child wants direction. They'll tell you they don't want any direction, and they'll tell you, you know, Dad, you don't know what you're talking about. And uh, but in reality, they really want you there. And and I learned a lot. It had an Im a huge impact in the early part of my life. Um, uh, and just talking about what freedom really means to different to different people, and I had a chance to really think through what that uh, what that meant uh, to uh, to me. Uh, and that was a uh, that was a book that uh, that meant a lot. I love reading history books. <coughs> I uh, uh, whether it's reading about Napoleon and uh, all of his great conquest, or reading about Churchill and and the leadership that he provided uh, during the war and after uh, to Britain. Uh, those are, uh, are, are books that have an impact on me because I can relate or I try to relate. And I said, wonder, how would I have acted? How would I react during uh, the, the times that they were in if, they were, if I had the same challenge uh, that they have? I mean, I look today and I just marvel, for example, at uh, how President Bush is handling the, <coughs> the war. Uh, that takes guts. Uh, that takes a commitment. Uh, you know, it's uh, that wimp factor of his is gone now. I think forever, and uh, uh, I've uh, got a lot of admiration for him and, and how he's handled this. My career, I have really just loved it. It has been a challenge. There's something new every day for me. I mean, the the fantastic thing about the career is not just buying and selling companies. It's the fact that we've got a portfolio of companies that range all the way from hotels and motels to you know, television stations and cable TV companies and oil and gas and uh, consumer products <coughs> and industrial products. And anything that I want to know more about, I have that opportunity. It's right there. It's in our portfolio. And I can spend the time at a factory or with the management and learn as much as I want. And so that's, that's wonderful. That's a real challenge. You can't get bored doing that. If I just had one company and worked there all the time and I was a product manager, I could get very bored doing that. What I would do differently, when I went through school, as I've said, I was in a hurry. And uh, uh, I was in a hurry to succeed uh, when I got out in the, in the business world. And so I was an economics major in undergraduate and I was a finance major in, in graduate school. And I'm sorry today that I didn't take more courses in the humanities and history and in the arts. Uh, I'm trying to make up for it now. Uh, I have a, a reasonable art collection, and uh, so I try to study uh, 18th and 19th century European uh, painters and, and, uh, uh, and art. Uh, I uh, spend time with the New York City Ballet and enjoy the ballet. Uh, my wife has taught me a little bit about music and, uh, and opera, but she's a real expert in it. I don't know very much about it, but, but I've learned more. History. I'm sorry I didn't read more history. I'm sorry I didn't have that opportunity uh, to, to really focus because uh, things always repeat themselves. History is a great, uh, a great uh, teacher. It's a great lesson for the future, and uh, you can go back and, and learn a lot from history. And uh, so I'm sorry that I, uh, that I took uh, the route of, uh, of not having as many courses in the arts and humanities and history as I, as I would like to have. I like to succeed. Uh, I, I don't want to fail. And I said to you earlier, the, the fear of failure you know, drives a lot of people. Uh, that probably is part what drives me. I, um, I know there'll be things that I'll fail at, but overall I don't want to be a failure. And uh, I come back to the challenge again. You know, why am I uh, in a hurry? Why, why do I work as hard as I work? I do it because I enjoy it. I don't have to do it, obviously, but I enjoy it. I enjoy uh, creating something, financial creation. I'm not an artist or, or a musician, but but creating something that hasn't been done before. And I enjoy that. And um, we have a lot of people at this firm, and we're all built more or less alike. We love to succeed. Uh, there's nothing that gives greater pleasure than, than success. I measure it by accomplishing the goals I set out for. 
and they can be goals that are monetary goals. They can be goals that are uh, uh, goals that uh, uh, are personality related. Uh, I'm going to get this person to to this manager to think differently. I'm going to get this person to uh, to start thinking longer term. I'm going to get this person to to hopefully. Uh, uh, be more competitive, uh, to, to have a different purpose. And if I can accomplish those, those kind of goals, uh, that's success. Uh, money, uh, that's a way to keep score. It's, it's, it's important. But believe me, it is not the end all uh, at all. You get to a certain level and, uh, you know, how much money can you spend? Um, and so uh, what's, what's more important is the fact, I don't want to let our people down here. And I don't want to let the people down uh, in the field. We own, uh, as I said, have owned 38 different companies today. We have a portfolio of some 15 or 16 companies. And, uh, you know, we have uh, hundreds of thousands of employees uh, in these different companies with about $40 billion in revenue. They're counting on us. These people's livelihood depends upon, the in part, on decisions that we make. And... Uh, I don't want to let those people down. I want to do what I hope is the right thing. And yes, there's some pain going through it. Yes, there's some terminations early on. But in the long run, if we can make a company more competitive uh, and leaner and more profitable, they eventually are going to hire more people because they're going to grow and they're going to be able to make acquisitions uh, down the road, sensible acquisitions. Then that, again, is another success. It's another goal we set out for ourselves. And if we can accomplish that, and make companies, even if it's a handful of companies, more successful and more competitive, and those can be used as models to, uh, as we go forward. I think one of the most important things that I've had to overcome is jealousy from the outside, uh, of learning that not everybody's going to be my friend. Uh, they'll tell you they are. Uh, they'll look at you and say one thing and then turn right around and do something exactly the opposite. Or, stab you in the back. Sure, they're disappointments. Uh, they're disappointments in life. Uh, that's life. Uh, they're, uh, but uh, uh, coming to a big city, uh, the best background I could possibly have had is growing up uh, where there's green grass, growing up where family counts, growing up where friends really count, uh, and uh, growing up as a kid out on the playing field. Being on that playing field is so important. And um, that's given me the foundation for, for what I have today. And, uh, uh, but, <clears throat> I mean, I like to tell the story about how I sold magazines as a kid in the, uh, in the seventh grade in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I go to door to door. And I always had to be the best salesman. I wanted to go back to my junior high school and win the prize for the day of having sold the most magazines. And I, 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 that was a challenge for me, or, or collecting uh, waste paper, n newspaper, old newspaper. I go around and I collect them and keep them in the garage. My mother said, when are you going to get rid of that stuff? And I said, well, when you take me down to the waste paper dump, we'll, we'll get rid of it then. And I collect it in my, in my wheelbarrow and go around the neighborhood. And she'd take me down and we'd load, uh, load it on the scales and they'd pay me, you know, $1.36 or whatever it was for my newspaper. And I'd go back and do it again. Well, uh, I guess that's where I learned inventory control and marketing and, uh, and a little finance as a kid. Uh, just pretty common sense kind of kind of things, and uh, um, it was building those blocks slowly, one after another, taking one foot and putting it in front of the other, and uh, always keeping my eye on on what I try, wanted to accomplish. Where did I want to be? And uh, that's the important uh, the important. Thing. So that those were some of the things I had to overcome getting here. Sometimes it's not easy <laughs> because uh, people uh, want somebody with gray hair or no hair, as the case may be. As I said earlier in this interview, I uh, remember being down in, uh, in uh, Louisiana and people saying, you know, we thought somebody with gray hair was going to come here. Uh, and basically, I just say, just listen. You know, judge me for what I have to say. Judge me for how I handle you and for how I handle myself. And uh, <clears throat> it doesn't matter whether you're, uh, you've got a card that has a certain title. Uh, as long as they know you're in a position of authority, uh, don't ever belittle yourself. Uh, you'd be surprised what you can do if you set your mind to it. And I always had this attitude. I said, I can sell. 
I said, I can sell myself. If my ideas made sense, and it wasn't outlandish, and it wasn't crazy, and I wasn't being cocky, uh, but I got people to trust me, I got people to know me, uh, you can overcome a lot of that uh, youth. And, uh, and uh, I remember one time being down in, uh, uh, in, in North Carolina, we were buying a, uh, a, a brick company. And the management, uh, or the owner of this brick company, was called Boren Clay Products. The, the man was about 74, 75 years old. And, and he refused to sell this company to his son-in-law. He just had a block about selling this to his, uh, his daughter's husband. And uh, even though the daughter's husband was running the company and was doing a great job, he had to have somebody else that he would sell it to. And we became that person, and I, I must have looked to him like uh, some kid, you know, right out of school and wet behind the ears in 1974. Uh, but at the end, he says, you know, you're pretty bright, kid. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we hit it off. Uh, and I didn't tell him everything he wanted to hear, uh, but I was honest. And I told him, the, gave him my best judgment of how something could be structured and how we could buy this company. And... Uh, that was one smart man because he sold his brick company to us right at the top of the cycle. He almost hit it t to the day because the minute we bought it, we went out of the gate backwards. Uh, but uh, no, I was able to convince, and I, that was a challenge for me. I, I always liked that, uh, that ability to convince somebody who was much older that even though I may not have their gray hair or their maturity, uh, that uh, I knew what I was talking about. And I knew when to bring in the people with the gray hair at the right time. And, it was never do this all on your own, you know. Don't be afraid to have uh, somebody who can uh, get the job done with you. You know, if, two, if it takes two people to get the job done, bring in two people to do it. Well, there are enormous responsibilities. Uh, as I said, my father taught me a lot about giving back to society. And uh, often, the, uh, because you make a large contribution to one organization, people just assume you'll do the same uh, to their organization. And I give a lot of money to a lot of different organizations because I believe in so many different things. Um, and so there's enormous uh, pressure on me uh, to, uh, to give to this of time and of, and of money. And one of the harder things for me, quite frankly, is saying no. I don't like to disappoint people. Look, uh, your charity is just as important as my charity. Uh, maybe not to me it's not, but it's important. And uh, uh, you've got the same task at raising money as I've got the task at raising money in a different area. And as the federal government and these states are cutting back, there's enormous pressure on the private sector to do more and more for, the, uh, for these charitable organizations and the not-for-profit organizations. And believe me, I, I push our companies uh, very hard to spend an enormous amount of their uh, 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 money each year uh, on the not-for-profit sector. We've got to do that in, in every community which we serve and, um, and some which we don't serve. And so uh, one of my hardest things has been uh, to try to focus my efforts and not be all over the, uh, the yard. <coughs> and so I've focus them on, uh, on drugs and education, which I put together because I think they're interrelated very much, and then in the arts, and those are uh, the things. Uh, hospital care, I've, I've done some major things for Mount Sinai Hospital here, but that's one hospital, and that's where I focus my, my efforts uh, there. So yes, there are pressures. Uh, everybody wants me to be head of the capital campaign or, or chairman of the board of uh, whatever institution, and uh, it's always hard to say no. I, I remember when Jim Evans and Lawrence Rockefeller came to me, uh, Jim uh, was the chairman of Union Pacific and uh, retired and he became, he became chairman of Central Park Conservancy uh, for the Central Park. And they both came to me and asked me to be the, uh, the chairman of a $50 million capital campaign. And I, uh, they, they uh, told me, no, we don't want any money from you. You know, uh, we just want to talk to you about something else. So they asked me this and I said, well, I'll be back to you in about a week. And I got busy and I forgot about it. About three weeks went by, I said, oh my gosh. I've got to get back to Jim Evans. I owe him an answer. And at this point, I felt so guilty. I said, yes, I'll do it. And I said, the best thing that he, he did by that was not push me and not, uh, n not bother me uh, or put any pressure on me. Uh, I did it to myself. And uh, we've raised, at this point, $47.5 million. And we'll get there. We have until uh, June to do it. And, and we'll, we'll pull in the last part, I hope. But uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, the pressure of 
if you're successful at it, uh, you do a good job at it, everybody else wants you to do it too. I think I would say, first of all, pick a goal. Pick a goal that is within reach. Not too low and not too high. You can always raise the bar it's, it, as you go along. I've raised the bar. I've long passed my, my early goals. Um, and make a commitment to that. Believe in it. Believe in what your goal is. If you don't believe in it, you're never going to get there because you're never going to really make the effort. Be honest with yourself. Is this really something that I want? Is this a career path that I might want to take? Is this something that really interests me? Or am I doing it because my father wants me to do it or my mother wants me to do it or somebody else is doing it and so it's sort of cool to do it? Stay off drugs. Get a good education. Stick with that education because if you don't have the education, there's no way you're going to ever be able to attain that goal that you really set out for yourself. And lastly, have the courage of your convictions. So stick with it. Believe in what you're, if you set out for yourself. And be honest with yourself and with others. Those are the things that I think are very important for any youngster today coming out of, uh, going through school. It's very hard. The world's a huge challenge out there. And there's so many pockets to, uh, uh, to look into. There's so many avenues of success. It doesn't have to be business. It could be anything. I tell my children, look, you don't have to come into my business. Don't do something just because I did it. In fact, maybe it's better you didn't do that. But whatever you do, promise me one thing, and that is that you're going to give it your best effort. That's what I'd tell them. Oh, I have a lot of pleasures. The, uh, I love outdoors, being outdoors, and I, I love to fish, fly fishing, uh, particularly for salmon. I uh, love to ski. We, uh, my uh, love is going out to our house in Vail and uh, putting on the, the boards and, and uh, uh, trying new, new trails and uh, skiing the powder, uh, which both Caroline and I love to do, and I love being with her doing that. I love to shoot. I love hunting, uh, bird hunting uh, in particular, and so uh, that's, that's always great fun. And horseback riding. Caroline and I do a lot of riding together. Uh, we built a, a stable, an indoor riding arena, and uh, we both jump, and I, I love the jumping. That's a, that's a great challenge, another challenge for me that I, uh, that I like. And so those four things, uh, plus golf, uh, which I don't play as much anymore, but uh, those are my, my passion. Four or five things are my, are my passion. And, uh, you have to do something like that to uh, uh, get rid of the tension, take your mind off what you're doing, and, uh, and I love doing that. Uh, I uh, work out, uh, through, try to uh, work out at least three times a week in the morning, early in the morning uh, with a trainer. Uh, Got to do that to get rid of the stress and tension and, and keep uh, my body in somewhat reasonable shape. And uh, I feel better, if, you know, uh, that way. And my mind feels better, so I, uh, uh, I enjoy doing that as well. You have to make sacrifices on either side, but you also have to have understanding family uh, to know that you can't get to your, to your goal unless there are going to be some sacrifices uh, by them and, 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 of course, by me. Uh, look, I'd rather be with them many times than being out in... Uh, you know, the middle of nowhere uh, meeting with some lender. There's nothing more important to me than my children and uh, uh, focusing on them. It's, it's the quality uh, of time with my children, not the quantity of time that, uh, that I've found to be, uh, to work and to be important. And uh, so y you have to make an effort. My son, one of my sons is a very good wrestler in high school and I try to get to as many meets as I can and do his tournaments. Uh, I get as nervous and as excited as, as, he, he, as he does. Um, and if you don't have that, you can have all the money in the world and you really don't have anything because in the end it's your family that counts. You have to have a personal life. If you don't have a personal life as far as I'm concerned, you, you're missing half of your life.
Well, there really were two day, two two points in time that were very important. One was the day that the uh, after a very long, long day and all night we'd been up. Um, we thought we had an agreed upon deal. Um, the other group came back and started raising their bid, and that threw the board of directors uh, into uh, turmoil. And they spent from eight o'clock in the morning or so when we appeared before the board until seven o'clock that night debating. You know, did they want to take the uh, Ross Johnson Shearson offer? Did they want to take the KKR offer? <clears throat> and I felt enormous relief uh, when they came out and said, "All right." You've won. They had come out earlier, about two hours earlier, and they said, we would like you uh, and we'll pay you an enormous fee. Uh, I think it was something like uh, $250 million to uh, give us two more weeks to decide who to pick. And we didn't blink an eye. We said, absolutely not. You've got until today, and that is it. We want to own this company. We're not in it for the fee business. We are in it because we want to own this company and uh, we're not giving you any more time at all. And that was all documented in Barbarians at the Gate, and uh, in hindsight, um, we stuck to our principles. We're not in the fee business of doing deals just for fees. We're in the, in the business of buying companies and owning the equity and putting our own money up and making a company better. That's the opportunity we wanted, and we stuck to it, and we ended up uh, being successful in, in, in buying the company. And I felt great relief and, and, and excitement about it. I, I felt great excitement for our whole team because this firm was brought so much uh, closer together. Our advisors were brought much closer together with us, uh, particularly Dick Beatty, who was our lead counsel and the, who was the chairman of Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett, and just a wonderful human being. And that uh, was, was great pleasure for us. Our accountants who lived with us uh, from Deloitte, uh, Haskins and Sells in the, that time. and. Uh, so that was all great uh, excitement and relief. And the second time was the day that the tender offer was, uh, was actually accepted uh, and we had enough uh, shares in and we actually took control of the company. I guess it was a third period, which was in between, which was the day that uh, the bank financing had to, uh, to be in and we <coughs> were concerned would we get enough uh, bank financing. I had gone all over the world. I was in Europe and I'd been in Japan. Uh, and in the States uh, with a couple of my associates raising this bank financing. And it was the day that that had to come in. And we had the big, the large bid, the large uh, amounts of, uh, of commitments coming in. And we far exceeded what we had thought. And that was great uh, revelation because if we didn't get there, we didn't know what we were going to do. So we went to every bank in the world practically of size. So those were the three periods. I mean, another great story about you know, when you, when you have a bid accepted or you, or you get a transaction closed, the actual closing of it is, is anticlimactic. Uh, it's the time that really that the bid is accepted uh, or the time you get the financing, as in the case of RJR and the others, it wasn't as, as a big a concern because they were smaller and there was a lot of money available at, in those days. How times have changed. <laughs> Just that feeling, uh, you know, up there in the... In the uh, in the air and that camaraderie and just that excitement of, of wanting each other to know it's really part of a teamwork and, and it's one of the great pleasures I get is that team and that teamwork and uh, uh, making it work that way. You know, the thing I like to people say, well, how do you describe KKR? And I like to describe KKR as a football team. I, I say it's a football team with a two-headed quarterback with George Roberts and myself as the, the quarterback calling the the plays, and everybody's got a position to play. Uh, some play tackle and guard, and some play halfback, and not everybody can carry the ball. Uh, but if uh, the people that are on the line don't play their positions, then the quarterback or the halfback uh, or the ends are going to get tackled, and, and we're not going to go to the, uh, to the Super Bowl. And uh, I said, but if everybody knows the role they've got to play, and everybody is uh, compensated according to how the team does, not according to just how you do as an individual. Uh, we're going to do much better. And that's exactly how we run this firm. We run as a team. Uh, not only does everybody have a say, but everybody knows what they have to do. And we don't have to be telling people all the time what they have to do. These are self-starters at this firm.
After I graduated from college uh, that summer, I was given a job at the Madison Fund, which was a closed-in mutual fund in, uh, in, uh, here in New York. And Ed Merkel ran it, and uh, what a terrific guy he was. Uh, I was there for about uh, three weeks, and he said to me, he said, Kid, he used to call me Kid all the time, he said, Kid, uh, I want you to go out and uh, call on uh, a company called Tri-State Motor Transit in Joplin, Missouri. And I said, that's, uh, that's interesting. I said, but who's going to go with me? And he said, what do you mean, who's going to go with you? You're going to go by yourself. You're going to go meet with the president of this company, and you're going to uh, be there by yourself. And I said, well, I've never done this before. He says, well, no better way to learn than, uh, than trying it. So I put some, my questions together, and they reviewed them at the, uh, at the company at the Madison Fund before I went out. And I arrive out there, and uh, a man in jeans and a T-shirt picks me up at the airport, and it turns, he introduces himself, and I said, this is the president of the company. And I said, I knew that he was worth many millions of dollars because I knew how much stock he owned. And I said, well, I've just learned a great lesson that you can't tell a, a book by the cover. I said, what a, what a good experience this is. And I spent the day with him. Uh, he then took me to his house for dinner that night. And, uh, and the next morning, I spent some more time with him. And I called back to uh, uh, Ed Merkel, the Madison Fund. I said, we should start buying this stock. Uh, what the company did was uh, they were in transportation business, uh, hauling explosives. Uh, during the Vietnam War, so they were doing very well, and I got lucky, and uh, every share of stock we bought, the stock kept going higher and higher, and uh, Merkel thought I was pretty smart uh, there. Um, <clears throat> then he sent me out to call on a few other companies, and I remember calling on Roy Disney, uh, Disney, and that was just a great experience for me, never having uh, uh, met somebody like that. And, uh, I have read everything that I could before I got out there. I had all my questions uh, laid out. I'd really thought through what I wanted to ask, and as a result, it went very well. Uh, I then finished that summer and uh, was going to go to business school at uh, Columbia to get my master's. And I told the Madison Fund people I was going to do this, which they, they knew. And they wanted me to stay, and I said, no, I'm going to go ahead and get my master's. And I started at uh, Columbia, and after my first semester, I said, I don't know if this is really for me. Uh, I remember being in a class, a marketing class, my first year, first semester. And the professor said, how many of you want to work for Procter & Gamble? And everybody's hands went up. And I said, oh my gosh, this is not for me. I've got to get out of here. This is, I'm in the wrong place. Uh, but so I called my dad, and I said, I'm going to drop out, and I'm going to go back to work for the Madison Fund. He said, no, you're making a mistake, uh, son. He says, I think uh, you've gotten the worst over. The first semester is always the hardest at business school, and, and stick with it. It'll always be good to have your master's. And long story short, I did stick with it. And I uh, then uh, uh, asked the Madison Fund uh, if I couldn't come back and work, though, for the next three semesters while I was getting my master's at the same time. And they said, fine. I said, well, I'll have to work around my course schedule, and I'll try to arrange my courses so that I can do more work with the Madison Fund than, than a little less work maybe up at Columbia. And uh, I did that, <coughs> and I was able to call on other companies. And eventually, uh, the Madison Fund had a company which they controlled. Uh, it was the old Missouri-Kansas-Texas Railroad, uh, Denison, Texas. And we set up a holding company to uh, utilize the tax loss that was being generated by this railroad as it, uh, they were abandoning track that went into cornfields and so forth. And Merkel came to me one day and he said, uh, he said uh, Henry, he said, I'd like uh, you to buy companies for, uh, for Katy Industries. And I said, well, that's fascinating, but I said, I don't know how to buy a company. Uh, I've never bought a company in my life. And he said, look, kid, he said, you know how to pick stocks. He said, you buy a company the same way you buy stocks. If you don't like it, just sell it, and that's, and that's that. And I said, well, it doesn't sound right to me, but this man's been pretty good in the stock market. He must know. He's a lot older than I am. And so I, I said, fine, I'll, uh, let's see if I can find some companies. And I thought about areas where I could buy small companies and really build a group. Happy, but it's not going to really upset you that much. What you really want to do is get it back to the Avis counter before they, they see the scratch. Whereas in, uh, if you own your own car, you put a scratch in that car, you're going to be out there polishing it and making sure that scratch is going. You're going to take extra special care. It's exactly the same concept if you own a company, if you have uh, your own money at risk. What happens eventually, you start to say, well, do we really need all those people that we have in the company? Do we need a, um, uh, as many airplanes? RJR, for example, 
Uh, we had 81 people in the flight department when we bought the company, and they had 11 corporate jets. Today we have about 24 people in the flight department. We have four, four planes uh, today. We've got one airport versus four airports that the company had. And you just think differently. So I'm giving you a, a, a very long uh, answer to, uh, to what appears to be a simple question, but everything was done in steps, and, and everything becomes a building block. And as my mother has said to me on many, many occasions, uh, you've got to build the foundation first. If you build that foundation, both the moral and the ethical foundation, as well as the, uh, uh, the business foundation and the experience foundation, then the, f then the building won't crumble. But if you don't build that foundation, and it's not a solid foundation, the building will crumble. Funny. I never thought that there was such a big deal when we, uh, when we made the offer. <laughs> I guess it wasn't until I woke up after we bought it, and uh, see, that was really a big deal. <clears throat> that wasn't the issue. That isn't how we looked at things. We didn't say, gee, we want to buy the biggest company in the world, so we've got to own this company. That, look, if the, if the company didn't make sense or the price didn't make sense uh, or we couldn't do the financing on the proper terms, we wouldn't have done it. Uh, it would have been as simple as that. But in <clears throat> 1984, we were called in to, to make a bid on Gulf Oil when Boone Pickens had gone up to the management asked us to get involved with the company. And uh, that, uh, our, our offer then was a little over $13 billion. And we never really thought a lot about it. I mean, we bought companies for $8 billion, which is the, uh, the Beatrice acquisition. We bought uh, Safeway for 4 and a half or $5 billion, and Owens, Illinois, for about the same number. <clears throat> and there was money available uh, out there. And so it wasn't an issue of, gee, it's $25 billion versus $8 billion. That wasn't really what went through. What, what went through our minds is a lot, lot to wrestle with. First of all was the smoking issue. Uh, no one at KKR smoked, and so it was, we had to wrestle with that. Uh, uh, did we want to own a company that was in the tobacco business? Um, if we ended up buying a company of this size and this visibility, it had to work because it is under a microscope, and everybody in America is waiting for this thing to fail, and we never doubted that it would that it would succeed. I mean, we knew it would succeed. And uh, we, we want to make sure that the, that the capitalization of the company was proper so that if there was a hiccup in the earnings, that it had a fallback. The companies that have gotten into trouble are those that have razor-thin margin for error. And Murphy's Law, something's going to go wrong. And so things always, they never work out exactly as you uh, plan them. So you've got to make room for the possibility that things will not be exactly as, uh, as you had hoped or as you planned. So we built that into that capital structure. And uh, visibility was a, was a big issue with us. Um, what did it mean to our families? What did it mean to our private life, particularly George Roberts and myself? Uh, it was something that uh, both of us wrestled with a lot. How was Washington going to view, view this? What did it mean as far as how we be accepted or not accepted in, in, uh, by senators and congressmen and, you know, were they going to be after us uh, because we've made this large acquisition? We didn't start it, as you know. It was started by the management of the company. We came in and, and uh, succeeded in buying it. And so these were the things that went through our mind much more than, gee, it's $25 billion. Uh, we said, because it's $25 billion and because we're borrowing $14 billion from the banks of bank debt, that if this fails, we don't want to be the ones known uh, to, to have brought down the banking system. We have to make this work. My dad was reading an article in Time magazine about uh, uh, the uh, Oxford, Cambridge of the West Coast because it's a group of small colleges. It's Pomona and Scripps and Harvey Mudd were there at the time in the graduate school in Claremont. And uh, uh, I wanted to go to the West Coast uh, because I'd been in the East boarding school for five years. I'm from Oklahoma originally. And I said, I want to see how the other half of the United States lives. And, uh, and I love to play golf, too. And so I uh, wanted to play competitive golf out there. So I, uh, I went out, and uh, I uh, liked it. Except my first year it was like a prep school with ashtrays. <laughs> so uh, 
So I decided that uh, maybe I would transfer. And then the more I thought about it, uh, the more I said, no, this is the right school. And then I, I really went there for uh, because it was very strong in economics and in political science. And those were the two areas that I wanted to focus uh, my uh, uh, future on. I was an economics major in, uh, in college. And every summer when I was on, uh, uh, and after school, I would drive my car from California, from uh, Claremont uh, Men's College at the time, to, uh, to New York, and I worked on Wall Street. Started out as a runner, I, uh, which was a messenger. I went to uh, uh, the other runners' homes in Brooklyn and Queens, and just to see how they, uh, how they lived, how they thought. Uh, they were totally different than I was. And uh, then my next summer, I worked in the research department at Goldman Sachs. And my last summer, I was in uh, the institutional sales and uh, in, uh, <clears throat> in corporate finance. And I thought at the time that I wanted to go into institutional sales, which were selling stocks and bonds to institutions. And I said, because in those days, which was now in the 1960s, the uh, salesman was making about $100,000 a year. And, and I said, that's just an enormous amount of money. But the one thing that always stuck in the back of my mind but I said, what happens if, for some reason, uh, this institutional sales doesn't really work? I mean, it, it's not all that it's uh, supposed to be. I said, I'm really trained to do nothing. I am trained to be maybe a shoe salesman. And, uh, and I said, uh, the second thing that bothered me, I said, you know, when I'm old, that meant 45 years of age, I said, I won't have an office. I don't want to be at some desk yelling and screaming and people hearing what I'm saying on the phone all the time. And I said, that bothers me. These people don't have an office. And uh, so I then started looking on the corporate finance side and uh, became fascinated by that. Uh, but I said, uh, before I make up my mind what I want to do, I want to find out how uh, an institution uh, that buys stocks and buys bonds, a fund, how do they make the decisions? How do they make a decision to buy, uh, whether it's uh, you know General Motors or IBM or whatever company it is? I want to find out how the other side works because I don't understand how it is that one time uh, a institutional salesman has a special on uh, IBM and the next day he's got a special uh, block of stock on some other company and then an another day another company. How can he know so much about these different companies other than reading a you know, one page is given to them by the research department. I'm going to find out how the decisions are really made from the other side, and then I'll make a decision what I'm going to do. My father wanted me to go in the oil business. He was in the oil and gas business as a uh, consulting petroleum engineer out in Tulsa. Uh, had an incredibly good reputation, which, interestingly, I learned more and more about as I was living in New York because everybody would come to me and say, are you Ray Kravis's son? And I would just beam uh, and say, yeah, I didn't know you knew my dad. Oh, yes, you know, I worked with your dad on this uh, transaction or on this uh, company in the oil business. And I, um, I thought about it, but I said, look, as proud as I am of my father, I don't want to be known as Ray Kravis's son. Uh, I want to do something myself. And I hope my children will do something on their own. Uh, my dad helped me. He was there as a uh, very loving and supportive father. But uh, I said, I've got to do it myself. As a kid, my mother uh, says to me, you know, you were always uh, me myself as a kid. You wanted to tie your shoes when you didn't even know how to tie your shoes. Uh, but you had to do it yourself. And, <clears throat> and it was the oil service business I picked uh, because there were a lot of family companies uh, down in Louisiana in particular. So I spent a lot of time in New Orleans and found a number of companies uh, in the surrounding areas like Homa, Louisiana and Berwick, Louisiana and Lake Charles. And I go down and it was always, I'd sit in these people's homes in their kitchen sometime eating uh, crayfish with them and shrimp and, and they'd say, uh, well, where's uh, the guy with gray hair? I assume somebody with gray hair is going to come down. If my company's going to be sold, I'm not going to sell it to some kid here. I'm going to sell it to some guy with gray hair. And I said, well, unfortunately, it's me. It's, it's the only one you get to deal with. And so I bought a few companies, and they worked out all right. And uh, eventually I left uh, uh, the Madison Fund and Katy Industries and, and uh, then uh, ended up at, at Bear Stearns in their corporate finance department where my uh, cousin, George Roberts, uh, was working and also where Jerry Kohlberg was working. And 
Jerry had bought a company, it was the first buyout that uh, the firm had done in 1965. And I started studying it, liked what I, what I saw, and George and I kept talking about it. And, we, uh, and then late 60s, we started buying a few companies in early 70s, and they were all very small uh, companies. George, at that point, was in San Francisco and uh, with Bear Stearns, and I was in New York with Jerry. And we bought, uh, oh, probably uh, seven or eight or nine different companies in the early 70s, and culminating in the uh, largest acquisition that Bear Stearns uh, did, uh, which was in 1975, was a company called Encom International. And it was the, the industrial components group of companies uh, from Rockwell. And we paid $92 million to buy this company. And uh, uh, Bear Stearns, I remember, got the biggest uh, fee they'd ever gotten, uh, which was in 1975, was uh, $950,000. And uh, we decided shortly after that, that's uh, George and Jerry and I, to leave the firm. Uh, we wanted to do something on our own and uh, really wanted to concentrate just on uh, management buyouts or leverage buyouts, which are one and the same. And I. Uh, uh, we said, okay, let's go off, and in May, on May 1st, 1976, we formed this firm, and uh, uh, the rest is history. We, uh, we got lucky. Uh, I think we've had some principles that we've stuck to, uh, very disciplined investors and very disciplined people here, and uh, that's what's given us uh, uh, the ability to say no. It's one of the most important things at the end. Uh, of the day is being able to say no to an investment. Uh, even if you've done a lot of work, uh, work will never hurt you. And, uh, but once you buy a company, uh, you're married. You're married to that company. And it's not like Ed Merkel said, if you don't like it, you just sell it. Uh, you know, you've got it. And it's a lot harder to, to sell a company than it is to buy a company. And since we formed the firm in 1976, uh, we've bought uh, some 38 different companies, and we spent about $65 billion uh, buying these different companies. And people always uh, will call and congratulate us when we buy a company or when it's announced. And I said, look, don't congratulate us when we buy a company. Congratulate us when we sell it. I said, any fool can overpay and buy a company as long as money will last uh, to buy it. I said, our job really begins the day we, uh, we buy the company. Uh, and we start working with the management, and we start working about where this company is headed and make sure that that capital structure that we have in place is the right capital structure. And I think that's, uh, that's the reason that we've been successful. It's, it's not just buying the company. Sure, we picked right companies, and we picked the right management. We've given them the right incentive to, uh, uh, to perform. But most importantly, uh, we've uh, had the management have the right incentives. Management has been an owner. Management has had their, uh, their own uh, uh, equity on the line. Uh, they have something at risk. Uh, I always like to refer to many managers in corporate America uh, as the renters of the corporate assets, not the owners. And I said, you know, where have the Carnegies and the Mellons and the Rockefellers gone? Well, a lot of them are gone. And our concept is to bring that back, to bring back that ownership so that if you have something at risk, you think differently. Rent an Avis rent-a-car. If you go out and you rent an Avis rent-a-car and you put a scratch on it, well, you're not going to be that 